Welcome everybody. We're gonna go ahead and get started um, so we can give our wonderful guest facilitator a, an ample amount of time to be here. Um, I'm Vernon Wall, um, he, him pronouns. I, um, I'm di the Director of Business Development with Leadership. And so for those of you who, this is your first time with us, welcome. For those of you who have been here for a few moments, um, welcome back. Um, we're excited to um, engage in another uh, virtual conversation um, or for leadership educators and really for us in the world, in the community. So we always begin, you know, I always say that, you know, if you don't know how to use Zoom, you've not been in the, on the planet in the last three years, but you never know. Um, but we'll tell you how we use Zoom um, today for, our, for this hour. One is, one of the things we've enjoyed about these conversations is that it's been very robust in terms of using the chat, not only to talk with the facilitator, but to, to talk to each other, to share resources. The one we had yesterday, there were so many resources that were popping up in terms of people sharing books, videos, podcasts. I mean, it was just fantastic. So feel free to use it to do reflections, to ask questions of each other, um, to connect with each other, to maybe um, have conversations later. Um, we will post polls from time to time, um, and you'll be able to respond on the screen when they appear. Um, we, since, you know, we, we've got about 28 people now. I have a feeling that by the time we actually start, we'll probably be up to about, you know, 40. So it may, it's going to be difficult for us to unmute um, and ask questions, but not to worry. Um, Tanya and uh, my colleague Abby will be um, sort of monitoring the chat and uh, making sure that we allow for folks' um, thoughts to be shared um, and with, with Tanya to make, and Tanya's going to be doing it too, just to kind of get a sense for that. So um, yeah, so we just ask that you um, mute your microphone and um, you can keep your cameras on or off, it's, it's either. And usually at the end, depending on how much time we have, um, you know, Tanya will stay around for just a little bit um, just to, you know, see if there's any, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one questions that folks may have. There we go. Would love to begin with our land acknowledgement. Um, I do want to share with you for me, um, it's really important for us to not see the land acknowledgement as sort of a checklist in terms of something that we have to read. We need to, we need to take it in. Um, the land acknowledgement is a spiritual experience of us um, thinking about the land, the water, um, and the people in the air. I mean, it's really that. And so really when you see a land acknowledgement, I just ask that you do three things. One, Think of native and indigenous people who settled the land before us. Um, and I'm, I live in Washington, DC, the ancestral homeland of many native and indigenous tribes, but primarily the Piscataway and the Anacostic. And if you don't know um, the, the native um, and indigenous folks in your communities, we invite you to um, research that and get a sense for um, and celebrate um, native and indigenous people. The second is, thinking about our own ancestry, the people who came before us, the shoulders that we stand on that allow us to be here today, which allows us to connect with native and indigenous people. The third is to think of how we can decolonize higher education, how we can decolonize the work that we do and make it more equitable. So please, anytime you see a land acknowledgement, I, I just ask that you do those three things. And um, yeah, let's pause for a moment. Okay, for those of you who do not know us at Leadership, um, just wanna let you know that we're not-for-profit and we are committed to um, a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. Our mission is to transform the world by increasing the number of people who lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. And just a quick plug to let you know that we do have virtual and in-person programs that are really, taking off these last few months, which we love. Um, so www.leadership.org, if you really want to engage with us and, and have more conversations about how we can be, how we can support you and, and the work that you do. Um, there, if you would Google the term leadership, I know that most of you know that there would be thousands and thousands of definitions, but at leadership, we believe that leadership involves living in a state of possibility, making a, making a commitment to a vision, developing relationships to move that vision into action 
and sustaining a healthy level of a high level of integrity um, and healthy level of integrity too. Um, effective leadership takes place in the context of a community and results in a more equitable society. So without further ado, I, you know, it's, I'm just honored to have um, Dr. Tanya Williams join us. For those of you that don't know, Tanya is a member of the leadership staff. Um, and I'm just going to turn it over to her so she can just enjoy you and the people here. Thank you, Tanya, for being here. It is my pleasure, Vernon. Um, and uh, thanks for uh, really getting us started and for your attention to the land acknowledgement in ways that um, have it be more than a checkbox. Um, so thank you for that. I will tell you that I probably have um, overpacked my time because that is one of my chronic patterns. And I am very excited about the work that, uh, or what I'll get to share with you today. Um, I'm calling this a dare to lead primer. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why I call it that. And I'm just gonna pop my slides in so that you can see where we're headed. I'm gonna try to move at a pace that is um, useful to you. Please come in with whatever questions you have. Uh, and as much as we can have a conversation through chat, um, I have a couple of polls. Uh, I wanna be able to do that with you today. Let's go ahead and get started. So it's a leadership dare to lead primer because uh, what I wanted to offer is for folks who are familiar with Brene Brown and specifically the Dare to Lead book. I know a lot of folks have probably know who she is. If you don't, I don't make that assumption anymore. Um, I used to because Brene Brown is absolutely, it feels like everywhere. She was on Netflix. She was on, she's on HBO Max now. Um, she has like, I think at this point, seven books out. Her most recent is Atlas of the Heart. Um, and it doesn't mean that everybody knows who she is. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about her in a, a minute. Uh, but this primer is just giving you some sense of what the Dare to Lead curriculum is. Um, and, and I'll tell you how I actually ended up being able to share some of this information. So who am I? As Vernon said, I am um, a staff member at Leadership, and I also do um, my own consulting uh, through um, a social justice lens, looking at you know identity and power. Um, most of my days are spent in that systemic oppression, uh, education, and destruction world, uh, and I read Brene Brown, connected with a lot of what she was saying, specifically around vulnerability. I think I read her um, first book, well, her second book, is actually her second book, um, The Gifts of Imperfection. And I was like, wait, this person is saying something different. Um, and it just so turned out by the time that Dare to Lee came out, she had decided to um, really train some facilitators so that we could really get the Dare to Lead curriculum and some of this work out in organizations. Uh, and I was trained in 2019, so pre-pandemic. Um, and 2020, because uh, the curriculum was meant to be delivered in person. And 20, I think it was about May or June of 2020, uh, the Brene Brown, um, education and research group, she has a whole organization, uh, decided to take it like that we could take it online. And so I have facilitated this curriculum uh, with intact organizations. I've facilitated the curriculum um, where we just offer it. Like, for example, I just did a LGBTQ plus uh, centered curriculum. So anybody who identified in any of those identities, we brought them together for six weeks um, and facilitated the, that group through the curriculum. So it's an intact and as well as a kind of offering. I've been in, I'm a native Texas Texan. I live in Brooklyn right now and I've been in New York for nine years. So 
Dare to Lead, I've already said some of this information, um, but the book was published in 2018. She trained 700 facilitators and I think she stopped training and I've heard whisperings, there may be a new training coming up um, to pick that back up for folks, but it is around the globe and it is really translated in, into a number of uh, different languages because it is being facilitated in um, multiple locations around the globe. In total, the curriculum, I'm clearly not gonna share uh, 24 hours worth of curriculum today, but in total, it is meant to be a 24 hour curriculum that a team goes through. Um, and I say 24 hour plus, because we're talking about things like vulnerability, shame, trust. Um, and so to do it with its depth and to really have people allow for their process, it probably is a longer, um, you know, I'm, I'm facilitating it now with an intact team and we could easily go for another six sessions um, after completing our last, next one and last one. Um, but, it's been done in a number of ways. So two hours, four hours, uh, intact retreat, there's a lot of things. The bottom line to the curriculum is that it is a courage building program. It's a courage building curriculum so that teams, individuals, organizations can lead from what she calls grounded confidence. And what grounded confidence is, is um, I'll show you in a second, but I, I, I want to highlight that her definition that she uses for leader is not too far away from leader shapes. And I think that that was partially why, why I was drawn to this. I've been with leadership now as a co-lead and a staff member for over 20 years at this point. And so leadership's definition is my definition of leadership, because that's how I, I learned what a leader was and what leadership is. I appreciate that she says that a definition of leader, and this is how she approaches this work, anyone who takes the responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes, and who has the courage to develop that potential. And so it is not about position, but it's a recognition that a leader actually has to have courage in order to live into and see what is possible within organizations, with what's possible within families, what's possible within relationships. Um, and so I appreciate this definition of leader. So keep that in mind as we kind of walk through some of the curriculum and um, what it might look like uh, when, it, you, when you think about it. Because I, I, think, I think she built this um, mainly for nonprofits, corporations. She even talks about in some of the work, um, taking it into the armed forces. And I, I have been kind of wondering and thinking about like, so how does that get tweaked? Not only for potentially students, because there is just some foundational great information for student leaders, but then also leaders and uh, folks who work in higher education. And so as we're going through some of this, do think about like, um, how might this be used in the work that we do in, in the classroom, and or in my uh, team or part of the university that I'm in. So in this curriculum, there's lots of concepts to keep up with. Um, she is a researcher and I love that about her work because it has, it gives some grounding. And I actually think it helps us kind of in, in higher education, uh, it can help people see it as, um, valuable. And so the research basically says that daring leaders practice grounded confidence in the place of armored leadership. And so there are ways that we have learned as a result of, you know, through my lens, being in systems of oppression, depending on our identity, um, has created an experience of armoring up as she talks about it. And this curriculum is meant to help us think about like, what are the skills that I actually need to practice in order to practice grounded confidence so that I won't have to armor. And so what is grounded confidence? She talks about grounded confidence as the messy process of learning and unlearning. 
practicing and failing and surviving a few misses. It's built on self-awareness and practice and lifts up and supports our efforts to be brave. If you spent time with that definition for a long time, it's sort of like, oh, right. So how many times do I practice grounded confidence in the meetings that I'm in? How many times do I need to practice uh, grounded confidence with students or um, coworkers or colleagues? And I don't end up practicing it because I don't know that I have the skills to do that. We end up powering our way through stuff as opposed to staying in, and what I see in this, this definition, as opposed to staying in relationship with people and inviting them into sometimes very difficult um, situations or moments or, or conversations. And instead of grounded confidence, we practice armor and we end up uh, creating spaces that are, um, full of armored people, which don't feel really great in our organizations. And so I appreciate that she's using research to say, we can do this vastly different. So grounded confidence equals having some rumble skills and, and basically a rumble for her. She uses all of these Brenneisms as I talk about them, but a rumble is that difficult moment. It's, it's being able to show up in um, tough conversations, tough moments, unarmored, but having the skills to be able to show up there. And courage and curiosity and practice. And so all of that is, is what is included in this curriculum. So she talks about the heart of daring leadership and, and the grounded, you know, when you think about daring leadership, if I want to be a daring leader, these are the, the things that I really need to, to understand. You can't get to courage without rumbling with vulnerability. Clearly a big portion of this because she for a while was known you know, as the, the vulnerability person. Um, a good portion of this is uh, understanding and rumbling with vulnerability. And we're gonna do a little bit of piece of that today. Um, but you can't get to courage. We think sometimes we can just muscle on to courage or muscle up bravery True courage actually um, is like vulnerability and courage are like right there together. And so we've often been taught that vulnerability is weak and the way that it's talked about, um, I think and shown in a lot of movies and you know, social media, it's actually talked about as weak, but she really interrupts that and is clear about courage and vulnerability are right there together. Another piece is um, understanding vulnerability more deeply. And so uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. I love that definition of vulnerability because it's an easy check for myself. When I am facilitating, and I tell this story often, a colleague of mine, when I worked in, um, at, on a college campus as the diversity and uh, equity person, I would get up and tell these really seemingly vulnerable stories. And so I would get up in front of students and tell the story, a story of my coming out to my parents or tell a story of um, dealing with racism when, as a child or these seemingly vulnerable stories. And one time a colleague of mine said, you know, <laughs> you look like you're being vulnerable because the story that you're telling may hit in a vulnerable place for someone else. But I know that you actually aren't being vulnerable because there is no uncertainty there. And I can check this story now. She didn't say it this clearly, but there's, there was no uncertainty there. I'm like, I can deliver this. I can deliver the story. The story has already happened to me. There's very little risk in the, in the way of not being accepted because I had uh, power in that way, uh, being an employee. And emotional exposure, yes, to a point, because again, I had practiced it. And so I think about that story uh, connected to true vulnerability. I can feel when I'm in true vulnerability now because of this definition. Are there moments of uncertainty? 
do I feel like I'm taking a risk? And might there be some emotional exposure? And that, and I, I sometimes usher myself into those moments because I know that that is also the place where we, we can sometimes connect. Another piece of this is self-awareness and recognizing that self-awareness and self-love matter. Who we are is how we lead, pretty crystal clear in that way, um, that we have to understand who we are. We have to continuously explore who we are. And, and this connects to her definition of belonging, um, recognizing that I can actually practice self-love and um, belong to myself. And I have to do that before I can belong to any uh, other spaces. And so I love that she includes this. She doesn't go deeply into it in the curriculum, um, but it is a recognition that this is at the foundation of daring leadership. And lastly, look over here. Courage is contagious. When I see someone else uh, being courageous, I there's a piece of me that moves into my own willingness to practice courage and practice vulnerability, practice um, building trust, reflecting on my values. And so we can actually, and this is a really important piece, we can actually cultivate a culture in our workplaces, in our families, in our friend groups, where brave work, tough conversations, and whole hearts are the norm and armor is not needed. Sometimes when people see that, it's sort of like, I don't know how to be in a workplace unarmored. I don't know how to be in a workplace as my whole self. I hear that a lot in the work that I do. And it is about creating cultures actual workplaces where armor is not needed that actually transforms things. And so this curriculum can assist in think, making you kind of work with that in a, in a, as a team. So let's look at um, the courage building skills that are covered in the curriculum. So think of these all as skills and it was a transition for me when I first started learning about this, a transition of, oh, vulnerability is a skill. It's not something that we necessarily, like we are vulnerable when we come into this earth, but we also learn how to armor up. And so to choose into vulnerability is absolutely a skill. So rumbling with vulnerability. And, and in this, we get into obviously understanding vulnerability, but also understanding shame and shame resilience, because shame is actually sometimes what gets in the way of our vulnerability. Another courage building skill is living into your values. And I won't say this is my favorite part of the curriculum, but it's the one that I feel like um, it definitely aligns with leadership and leadership's work of uh, we actually can't be the leaders that we uh, strive and want to be without being clear about what our values are. And our values are actually going to help us step into those moments of courage and those moments of vulnerability and to practice shame resilience because our values are going to remind us who we are and what we believe. And so I love that she has this as part of um, the curriculum. The next one is Braving Trust, and, and I believe I'll have enough time to show you the acronym. Braving, she actually is broken up into um, the seven kind of elements of trust building. And so it's a really helpful way to think like, we often move into spaces and think, okay, I either trust you or I don't, or you've got to prove yourself to me um, before I can trust you. And what her research team has done is said, if these seven things are, are present, each letter represents one of those elements, trust is being built. And so it, it really operationalizes trust from my perspective. And then the last one um, is learning to rise. And it's the recognition and again, aligning with leadership's work around resilience 
It's the recognition that if we are daring uh, in our leadership, if we are really practicing, you know, grounded confidence and gonna be in these tough conversations, there are moments that we are going to face plant. We are gonna make mistakes. We're gonna absolutely, you know, get hooked sometimes by our own triggers and emotions and learning to rise. Um, she helps us think about, you know, how do we do that? How do we do that well? Uh, and, and it, again, aligns for me really closely to the resilience curriculum that Leadership um, has out in the world. So I've mentioned armored versus daring. Um, and I, I wanna show you this list. And in the book, if you don't have the book, I do recommend it. Um, it's not necessary to read the book in order to do the curriculum. And in the book, she explains all of what daring leadership, what, what are all of the um, kind of coded descriptors of what armored leadership is and coded descriptors of what daring leadership is. I just wanted to show you and have you see that when she talks about armored leadership, um, and I'm gonna ask a question from this and so I'm gonna spend a little time here. When she talks about armored leadership, those are the things that either people in organizations are practicing that create a culture that where armored leadership is necessary, or there are ways and um, practices, if we're practicing these courage building skills, ways that daring leadership can be practiced. And so hopefully um, you'll be able to read this uh, when I get to that list, um, but I do wanna hit a couple of points. And so she says, it's not fear that gets in the way of courage, it's actually armor. And that one, that was one of those that I had to think about it for a while. Like, what do you mean it's not fear? What she says is fear is always gonna be present. And how we deal with the fear is, makes the difference. And most of the time we armor when there is fear. She's inviting us to choose this daring path of courage and practice these courage building skills so that we don't have to armor when fear is present. Fear, fear is just an is. And how do we respond to it? When we're in a difficult situation, uh, we follow a thought, thought process and, and she, in the curriculum, she, the, her voice is really present in the form of videos. Um, she tells this really great story about, you know, sometimes it, if you think about transformers, that's sort of how our armor happens. Like we experience something and the thought process in our head actually moves us into a place of armoring we actually can choose something different. We are, notice when this, these columns come up, we're everything in both columns. And so it is really, how do we practice the skills that, that move us closer to the daring leadership, but recognizing that there is all of that that is available to us. And then lastly, again, getting back to that place, place of, it's important to build cultures where armoring is not. Um, rewarded, nor is it necessary. So these are the ways in which she talks about armored versus daring leadership. And I'm going to give you a second to read through these. And I would love if people are willing to take the risk, I do recognize that, and maybe I'll ask it in a different way. Um, if folks could share in there in the chat, maybe I'll go with a daring leadership. I was gonna ask you about where do you see, what, which of these on the armored leadership side do you see in your organization? You can answer that if you want to. Your names are attached to things. I don't wanna kind of ask anyone to out themselves. And if you wanna to respond to the question, where might um, your organization, your office, your um, team, which of the daring leadership or the grounded confidence side, what, which might you benefit? So answer either one of those, either 
what kind of armored leadership do you see in your workplace? Or which of the daring leadership um, practices might you benefit from? So I'm gonna be quiet for a moment to let you just kind of respond to that in the chat. Thanks, Amy and Madison, for getting us started. So I'm loving um, folks putting a few things in uh, around scarcity-driven culture, um, potentially uh, benefiting from leading proactively and with a strategy. Um, oh, Matt, hi. Um, cultivating a culture of belonging. Uh, that's a, it's one that feels like uh, a secret sauce for some organizations. And I, I, I work with a lot of organizations. They're like, well, talk to us about belonging. It's like, okay, well, you have to understand belonging and, uh, and understand what it is before you can even cultivate it. And so digging into that. Yeah, Abby, practicing our values. Like we are a value-led organization. Uh, we lead others in reflecting on, on values. And so, um, we definitely, I love that we practice our values too. Yeah. Yeah. So I love this because, and you'll notice there's a big arrow in the middle that or, like organizations and people are on a continuum. And so we're not stuck in either one of these columns, but rather like at any given times. And, and I do a lot of work uh, around navigating triggers, at any given time, it's the recognition of noticing when I tap out of hard conversations, if I use one of those as an example. Noticing when, what's going on, who's present, what's the topic even, and remembering that I can build the skill to actually lean in and be vulnerable in hard conversations and practicing that. I think so much of, of what I see in organizations that I work with is that um, I'll come in and do a workshop. It'll be great for those four hours, those three hours. And then the next time I show up for a workshop, it's sort of like, well, was there any practice between these two moments? And the practice is what changes things. And so the continuum, we're not all going to, we're not going to do it perfectly all the time. And if we practice, we can see ourselves moving closer and closer to practices of grounded confidence. So I wanna have us, um, I was gonna have Brene's voice come in, but I, I'm looking at the time and I wanna make sure that uh, we have a little bit more time to get some other things This is a six minute video. Um, just know that Part of the curriculum is her coming in and sharing some of the uh, information points in her own Brene way. One of the things, she's a Texan also. She actually lives in Houston. She is a great storyteller. And that is some of what I enjoy most about her work. Um, but she does kind of come into the curriculum uh, and uh, deliver through videos. I want us to get into a couple of pieces just to get a, a better idea of some of these uh, courage building skills. First one I talked about was rumbling with the vulnerability and we go so much deeper into that. But one of the things that she talks about is the six myths of vulnerability. And I'm gonna have you respond to a poll um, once I kind of talk through these about which of these do you feel like you still kind of believe and that you need to unlearn? So I talked about the fact that we often are taught that vulnerability is weakness. 
Um, and sometimes we can know their vulnerability is weakness, but we don't know that vulnerability is weakness. We um, still maybe look at people when they are they are vulnerable or, or experiencing vulnerability. Um, we might see them as, oh my gosh, I wanna distance myself from you, or we don't choose into vulnerability. Those are ways that um, I might know that it's not weakness, but I don't know it internally and therefore then practice against that, you know, the, the myth. So think about that one. There's another uh, myth, I don't do vulnerability. It's sort of like, well, um, <laughs> and she says in the video, she's like, either, vulner either you do vulnerability or vulnerability is gonna do you. Like you cannot avoid vulnerability. It is absolutely a part of our, you know, reality in the world. And most of the time we don't think about it. I, I just came back from a, a two week trip on the road doing uh, work and, and experiencing some fun in, in the midst of that uh, travel. And thanks to Brene Brown, I now get on planes and uh, send really good thoughts to uh, the pilots. Because what's true is I am putting my, the hands of uh, uh, putting my life in their hands. Same goes, I, I don't have a car. I, I, I use Ubers every once in a while. I ride the subway all the time in New York City. I am doing vulnerability all the time. I often don't think about it. How can I choose into vulnerability in a relational way? And so if you're someone who's saying, I don't do vulnerability, it's rethink that. I can go it alone. That's absolutely, you know, it's a myth because there is nothing that I have in my house right now. Um, maybe outside of, I, even from the seeds, if I brought, if I grew some tomatoes, that still was something that was done with others or done with the earth. And so there's actually no going it alone. And so we are all in this uh, vulnerable, potential for vulnerability as, as we actually need each other. You can engineer this, the uncertainty out of discomfort, or you can engineer the uncertainty and discomfort out of vulnerability. Um, she actually talks about that people have approached her about creating apps that would engineer the uncertainty out of, you know, moments that happen in the office, or we're trying to kind of algorithm our way out of vulnerable moments. And she's like, you just can't do that. Trust comes before vulnerability. It's actually impossible because if you think about some of the people that you trust most, there have been moments that you probably either have been vulnerable with them or they have been vulnerable with you, which has strengthened um, your trust. And then vulnerability is disclosure. And this is my favorite, particularly in the social media world that we live in right now. Um, <laughs> just because we tell everything that is going on in our lives, just because we craft perfect Instagram and Facebook posts, it doesn't mean that we're being vulnerable. If we go back to that definition, uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, I can craft all of the, you know, Facebook posts that I want that tell these really great moments in my life, but it doesn't mean that I'm actually being vulnerable. And so people think that if I tell stories or if I cry in front of people, I am being vulnerable. It's actually not true. And so I'm gonna invite you all based on those myths, you can either use this um, QR code or I'm gonna put a uh, link in the chat Use this QR code or this link, and um, I'm gonna take the QR code away in a second because I need to switch over to Mentimeter. So that, that link in the chat is actually gonna take you to a poll that's gonna ask you, how much do you need to unlearn any of these myths? And so use, I can't quite remember the rating right now. Um, I think it's one to five but use that poll to uh, 
think about and share how much do you need to unlearn any one of these um, myths of vulnerability. And as people start responding, I will put them, I'll put our spider graph up. And so the way to read this basically um, is I think it's one, I don't need to unlearn this at all. And five, what myth? <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, I didn't think this was a myth at all. This is absolutely true, Tannen. Um, so our spider graph is basically averaging out people's responses. And so as it goes right now, vulnerability, most people still are working to under, unlearn the a myth of vulnerability being disclosure. So I'll let a few more folks come in. And if anybody wants to share uh, via chat, you can do that as well. Um, either what is hard about un unlearning these myths or um, what specific myth feels hard for you to unlearn. And I've done this a fair number of times. And I like, I'm, I'm a researcher in my own mind as well, because I like looking at different groups and thinking about which one actually is showing up most often. And the trust comes before vulnerability one uh, for most of the groups that I've worked with is uh, usually the one that's the highest because it is, it's that, again, that fear piece of, I have to trust you before I can be vulnerable. Um, and it's hard for people to wrap their minds around, uh, okay, so I actually have to be vulnerable in order for someone to potentially trust me. Um, so it's just a, an interesting um, thing to, to note as when I talk, when I think about other groups. Um, Anna, can you elaborate further on vulnerability of disclosure? Yeah, so, so I really, I liked it. And, and Brene in the video, in one of the videos, she talks about, she's like, just because you, you know, live tweet <laughs> your bikini wax, or just because you, you know, share every single thing that you've done your, on the weekend, it does not mean that you're being vulnerable. It does not mean that, um, and I think a lot of, I, I've talked to some leaders, uh, some positional leaders in organizations that have said, you know, I don't know that I really wanna do this work because it's gonna have me, I don't wanna bring all of me to work. I don't wanna show up in that way. And vulnerability is not just about sharing everything about you. Just because I tell you I'm from Houston, just because I tell, told you that I um, told you anything about any of my identities, you know, the fact that I am queer and uh, identify as black and I was raised working class, I can tell you all of those things without being vulnerable. Maybe the first time, and I can remember actually facilitating uh, leadership um, institutes I can remember the first time that I facilitated a, a session at a historically black college and university and came out as a lesbian. That was a vulnerable moment for me because I had a lot of work that I had to do around. Um, and so that was both disclosure and vulnerability. But disclosure does not always equal vulnerability. And I think we get confused. Uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure can come by way of me letting you know that I made a mistake or um, telling you the truth about how I, I feel uh, about something that we're working on. And yeah, it's a form of disclosure, but it's not, uh, we, we often think it's like, if I tell you something and maybe I have 
some um, some attachment to. We think that that's vulnerability, and it's not always that. I hope that was helpful. Let me switch back to the slides because there's a little bit more I want to do. And do feel free to come in with questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can before we kind of wrap up. Um, what I want to make sure that we get in is this piece around trust. And so I mentioned that she uses uh, braving as a kind of an acronym for the elements of trust. And what she outlines is um, boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault. By vault, she just means essentially confidentiality. If I tell you something, you treat it in a way that you are a vault. Um, integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. And generosity is not like uh, a kind of generosity in, in the way of money or, or giving but it's more of like, do I have a generous heart for others? And then in the way, I'm, am I being generous uh, in my thinking about others? And so her team basically coded all of this information and in research that these are, when we think about trust, these are the seven elements that exist. And so if you think about your relationships, any of relationships that you have, colleagues, you know, how much of each of these elements are present? And that might tell you how much trust is present. Or you can think about moments where you are like, I actually don't trust that person so much. And which ones of these uh, elements might be missing? Another thing that I love in this curriculum um, and this, the whole series is one that you get a, a great workbook. And so you're working through all of these um, uh, work, workbooks and, and you know, workshop things. But she provides some really great um, opportunities for teams to assess, assess themselves. And so this is a team that I've worked with in the past. And um, a, around each one of these, the team got to kind of rate themselves and in their experience. And then that produces a really great conversation uh, for the team to have uh, with, with this work. The last piece, learning to rise. I'm not spending much time on values because if you're coming to a leadership program, you probably have uh, explored values or there is lots of, of work that we do um, around values that you can tap into uh, the work that we have. But the learning to rise piece, um, I just want to hit and highlight that she recognizes three steps to learning to rise. First, the, the reckoning, recognizing our own emotions, noticing when we get hooked by emotions, noticing what's going on. I think of it as, you know, noticing the triggers that come up. And then being able to tell the truth about that. And, and she talks about it as walking into our own story, like seeing at times that we're acting on a story rather than true or, or fact, factual things. And so being able to really stay with that um, is part of learning to rise. The rumble, owning our story, getting honest about the story, um, and then challenging the assumptions that we might have to determine what is actually factual and what's not. And then if we're really wanting to go deeper in that, like why did we create the story in the first place? And then the revolution, when process becomes practice. And I love that she has this as part of the curriculum. Not only like just writing a new ending to the story, um, based on the learnings that we do that we do or that we gain when we reckon and rumble but also being able to use this new story use these practices use these skills to constantly write new stories so that we we're not learning to rise from the same thing over and over but i'm learning to rise 
and I'm moving to a new space. And I, again, might face plant, but I'm learning to rise in a different way. So this is just a, a, a nice little reminder that our emotions are so much larger than we often think. Um, and I love adding this into the work that we do with uh, Daring Leadership so that people can really wrap their minds around like, oh, there may be something else that's going on beneath my fear or my anger or my sadness. Use that same link, I'm gonna put it back in there, to, um, to respond to the, another Mentimeter, which daring leadership skill set would you like to learn more about? What do you think would be useful? In my really quick overview, again, this is 24 hour curriculum. Um, in my really quick overview, let me make sure that I've switched over to the next Menti. Um, which would you wanna learn most about? And so, all right, there we go. Let me put that up as people respond. Yeah, the learning to rise one is uh, really cool to me because she also talks about, and this may be a part of the trust one, living big, um, living into our boundaries, uh, living into and being aligned with our own integrity and how do we practice generosity? Um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but she tells this wonderful story in an audio book um, that, you know, do we believe that people are doing the best that they can and how would we live differently if we did? And so she gets into all of that in this work as well as part of the Brave and Trust and Learning to Rise. Oh, thanks, Adrian. Yeah, Atlas of the Heart, if you have not gotten that, um, it's, it, it kind of overwhelmed me when I first got it because I'm like, oh my gosh, she's digging into every, like all of these, I think it's 66, 67 emotions and she's like digging into it. Um, and, and to, I have to read one emotion and then work with it a little bit before I move on to the next. And so it does not at all feel like a book that you just read cover to cover easily um, to really get the meat out of it or the vegetables, I'm actually a vegan, um, to get the, like, the oomph out of it, you might have to take it in pieces. Are there any questions um, or anything that I can respond to um, before we wrap up? Thank you for this opportunity um, to talk about this. I hope it has been helpful. Anything that folks want to share? Um, via chat or bring in via question. Oh, the last thing I want to share, feel free to tap, type your, your, um, your questions. So I keep talking about this as a 24 hour curriculum. Um, it is like you in some ways, the book is there. I've, I've heard of teams, absolutely reading the book together, digging in that way. If you want the 24 hour curriculum, on her website, there are 700 of us, of me, in the sense of uh, people who facilitate this curriculum and facilitate the like long um, version of it. And so check out those folks, they're all over the world. Um, many of us are doing it uh, virtually now. Um, there's some great, I've worked with some really great uh, folks in a lot of different um, industries uh, that have been doing this work as well. And so I just think the more that we, you know, again, learn the skills, what, what kind of impact would be available to us in our organizations, on our campuses, and more broadly in our lives. And so that's why I love this curriculum and love getting to do that with others. So thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Um, and I appreciate y'all coming and listening a little bit more. Take care.
Tanya, thank you for that wonderful work. I think um, as someone who gets to chat with you often, but still somehow not enough, I really appreciate always walking away from every conversation with you, having learned something that I chew on for the rest of the day. And I say that as a vegetarian. So I'm still <laughs> a lot of meat in that conversation, even if uh, we can be non-meat eaters together. So um, thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you always for the folks who have joined us in this conversation as well over Zoom. I hope that was a nice um, hour long lunch break or um, something to listen into while you were maybe taking a break from your work to talk about um, this topic of um, emotional intelligence, I think a lot of it, but also how we how we wear our vulnerability and how that shows up in all these different ways. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we do have another session tomorrow um, with Dr. Jenny Roberts and talking about international um, leadership or the perspective of being an international um, being in international environments and what leadership looks like there. And then on Friday, we'll be talking with Elizabeth Thompson um, about um, remote work and how we, I think we have all learned in this time that that has been beneficial to different people in different ways and what that then looks like as we kind of carry on into this post pandemic world. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, if anyone has questions, I think we can hang out for a little bit. <laughs>